Bon dia, el meu nom és Daniel Marco. Tinc el plaer de presentar-vos el keynote speaker de la primera sessió del Big Data Congress, que tenim aquí avui gràcies a la col·laboració de la Generalitat de Catalunya amb Garner. I am very pleased to present you the keynote speaker, Stephen Prentice. Steve is vice president of Garner Fellow since 1997, with 40 years of experience in the industry. His keynote is titled Bytes, Brains, Bots and Business, the Digital Disruptors. Steve will talk us about the increasing use of data with the small, medium and big business and, use, and the use of that to succeed in their business. Also, the use of new analytical techniques like artificial intelligence, machine learning to build new business models, new services and products, and also about some challenging questions regarding data privacy and ethics, digital ethics in this case. I hope he can show us the, the right path regarding this necessary digital disruption. It's Steve, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, whoop. Okay. Uh, well, this is actually a story about data. Um, it's a story about a number of issues surrounding the data. Um, and it's a story about some slides that aren't there, but never mind. Um, we live today in a world of data. And that world of data is growing at an unimaginable rate. A lot of you talk about big data, but it's not just about big data. It's about small data as well. And it's about unimaginably huge data. And the volume of data is growing, and the rate at which it is growing is accelerating. It is thought that something like 90% of all of the data in the world has been generated in the last two years. And on top of that, 90% of that data is unstructured. And that poses a problem because it's difficult to analyze unstructured data in the way that we've traditionally done it. A lot of our analytical techniques and models simply don't work effectively. So as organizations face the challenge of digital business and the digital transformation which is to come, which is the ultimate goal, it's a story of how they use that data, where it comes from. And data is interesting stuff. There's new sorts of data. You know, we tend to think of data as coming from machines, and it does. We estimate that there will be more than 25 billion new devices, or billion devices connected to the internet over the next few years. They're growing at the rate of around 150 every second, 24-7, 365 days a year. Now, obviously not at an even pace, but over time. Every one of those devices pumps out data. And on top of that, we are data. Everything we do, everything we say, everywhere we go, every transaction we make, person we meet, produces data. And the relationships between all of those create more connections, and that creates even more valuable data. Ultimately, that data will include everything, including our entire genetic makeup. So if you think the volumes of data today are large, then you haven't seen anything yet. The data we are going to have to deal with is far, far greater and creates far more challenges and equally far more opportunities for businesses large and small. So businesses face this challenge of how do we move from where we are today to where we want to be in the future, to this digital transformation. Now digital data comes in a variety of forms. There are new types of data data that we haven't actually thought of before. As I said, we are data. Many of you in this audience, I'm sure, have something like a, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or a device on you that measures you, how many steps you make, and so on. Many of you might have been given those by your insurance company. And as a colleague of mine once said, be very careful. If you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. And we give this data away. We post it on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on a whole variety 
of devices and, and applications and places that encourage us to give them data. My supermarket collects data from me. I let it. I tick the little box on the loyalty card. It knows what I am going to buy before I even leave the house. Since I live in the country and the supermarket is 20 kilometers or more away, sometimes I just wish they'd remind me when I get there so that I don't come back without something. So using that data is important. Increasingly, data is crowdsourced. We submit data, the state of traffic, is there a congestion on this particular road, and so on. We have more and more connected devices. Your car. Your car produces a vast amount of data about where it is, how you drive, where it's parked. That provides opportunities for services, a whole range of things. But along with that comes a problem. And then we have space. It has often been said that the only export we get from outer space is data. And that's true at the moment. Maybe in years to come, there will be more things. But at the moment, it's just data. And every one of those different data types gives us new opportunities. If we have location data, there are applications that we can build to help people navigate, to try and find the traffic jams, to find the best deal, and so on. They're all opportunities. The data is there put up data with people's likes and preferences and so on, and you have a revenue generating opportunity. The location of your connected vehicle, an interesting one. I recently bought a BMW i3, probably one of the most connected vehicles around. And it has some interesting features in there. There's a button in the roof that apparently if you press, will tell the BMW service center that you're in difficulty. And it will send out the tow truck and ambulances and whatever. And since I spend a lot of time traveling, that's reassuring. My wife is driving around. She has an accident. She'll be looked after. But equally, I have an application on my phone. I can be here in Barcelona or last week down in South Africa, and I can pull out my phone, boom, 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 see where my car is. What were you doing over there on Wednesday afternoon? Data on the one hand is useful. Data on the other hand is slightly questionable. How happy is my wife about knowing that I know where she is all the time? Fortunately, she doesn't quite realize what this app can do, but she will catch on and things will get difficult and I will have to answer for my snooping. Data itself often acts as proxy for something else. I mean, how can you measure the gross domestic product of a country in Africa from space? Well, the answer is you look at light. If people have money, if people have disposable income, they turn the lights on so that you can look from space at night and you can see levels of illumination. And if you do the analytics properly, you can start to estimate GDP of countries for which that sort of data is either not available or is manipulated by political powers who want to actually promote some decision or not. So data is not always what it appears to be. It can be other things as well. And every organization, large or small, faces this challenge of how do I use the data that we can have, and how do I take advantage of the new data arriving, the new sources of data, to come up with new business models? Because that's what it's about. This is not the pursuit of data. Data is interesting, but data itself is just interesting. It doesn't produce revenue. And at the end of the day, whether you are in the private sector or in the public sector, you need to actually gain some value from that data to produce a product, to gain a sale, to produce a service, to optimize the services provided to the citizens, and so on. So it's about the end results. But this use of data leaves people with two big questions. Who owns the data, and what can I do with it? And you might think, well, that's pretty straightforward. It's anything but. If you ask your bank who owns your financial data, and let's face it, they have a lot of information about every transaction that you make, and how much money you have, and what outgoings you have, and how big your mortgage is, and how much you're being paid every month, they know it all. You ask them who owns that data. And they'll likely say, ah, oh, well, it's complicated. No, it's not. It's very serious, but it's not complicated. But the question is, who owns it? And they can't tell you. 
If you are unfortunate or fortunate enough, depending on your point of view, to have a modern digital pacemaker installed to keep your heart beating soundly, in case of heart disease and so on, you might think, here I have a device, it's embedded in my body and it's monitoring my heart, it's mine. Uh -uh. If you ask your doctor, can I have the data from my pacemaker, he'll say, I'm sorry, it's confidential. What do you mean it's confidential? It's my heart? <laughs> nope. The rules on data privacy are kind of strange at times. You know, it may be that data is owned by the company that owns the pacemaker, by the doctor, and it's medical records, so it's covered by medical privilege and all of those sorts of things. So owning the data is a challenging one. And even if you can work out who owns the data, and companies have a lot of ways to actually do this. I mean, my supermarket owns the data about my shopping because I let them. You know, when I loaded the app on my phone and there were 40 pages and screens of terms and conditions and I clicked through all of them to the last one and just punched agree, I gave them the rights to use it. So legally, they own it. And every time you put something on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, if you ever cared to have read the 50-odd pages that come with the iTunes application and so on, you would have found you gave them the rights to use the data for whatever purposes they wanted, in perpetuity, whatever. If anyone actually read and understood the terms and conditions, they would probably never do anything. But we don't. We want to get on with our digital lives. So the question of ownership is challenging enough, but the question of what can you do with that data is much more challenging. The BMW example I cite is an interesting one. You know, there are times when I'm happy for BMW to use that data. It means that the tow truck arrives, or the ambulance arrives, the emergency services, and that gives me peace of mind. But equally, that same data about where my car is and how it's being driven and so on represents an invasion of privacy. Is it right for me to actually snoop on my wife? Is it right to allow her to snoop on me when I'm driving the car? I mean, it works both ways. So using the data is a question of digital ethics. And there are no cut and dried, black and white answers in digital ethics. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes we want people to use that data, other times we want to keep it secret. It's very difficult to do. And it's a very, very challenging issue for all organizations. So, we have lots of data, but it's not really about the data, it's what we do with it. It's about analytics. We talk these days about algorithmic business. Now, what is an algorithm? It's simply a packaged set of equations. It's a way to increasingly analyze data and the use of an automatic analysis in an industrialized sense, not just one-off, pervasive. Using algorithms throughout the business to increase productivity, to increase efficiency, automation, and also objectivity and speed. It's about providing competitive differentiation. It is enabling companies that are moving from simple use of static data and moving into digital business to do things more quickly, to analyze more data, to make better use of that data, and to be more objective and consistent about the way they do things. We use algorithms to drive speed and scalability in our digital business endeavors as we move forwards. Algorithms drive revenue. There's no doubt about that. I mean, Amazon's recommendation engine, you know, you've all experienced this. You go to Amazon, you buy something, and it says people who bought this were also interested in this. And some of the times you think, yep, that's a good idea. I'll have one of those, and you click on it. That represents an uplift in revenue terms of about 10 to 12% of Amazon sales. No one's quite sure. They don't release the figures. But that's a significant amount of money from an algorithm that simply monitors not only what you buy, but everyone else and what's available. And you kind of wonder, well, are they actually just trying to get rid of the stuff they can't sell as well, because there's that option? You know, it's kind of interesting. When you actually go on supermarket shopping sites, and most, of, most shopping now, online shopping, is done from mobile devices, have you ever thought about what's on the screen? You know, you have to be kind of a sort of geeky, cynical analyst to see a menu and automatically ask yourself, well, what were the options they didn't give me? Because we're all used to seeing menus, and we see the options, and there's a science to menus. You know, the way that things are displayed and what is top and bottom and in the middle and the order of everything is a complete science. It's about 
influencing, we'll put it nicely. It's actually manipulation, but it's influencing what we do and which selections we make. So when you actually go onto your supermarket shopping site and say, well, I want some tomatoes, and you get three choices because there's only a limited amount of space on a smartphone screen, you know, it could be taking into account what you bought last time, but it equally could be taking into account that, well, we've actually overbought on those tomatoes and we've got a caseload of them in the warehouse. We need to get rid of them. So let's put them closer to the top and hopefully people will buy them. So now instead of me choosing, I'm actually choosing from a limited selection of things that the supplier is providing. You know, there's a whole raft of things happen when we go digital and when we use data. Used to be simple mapping, for example. When you get into things like Waze and crowdsourcing, people in real time are saying, well, actually, no, something's broken down. You really don't want to go down this road or there's an accident here. So you're getting crowdsourcing to improve the capabilities. And people are willingly and freely giving up that information because ultimately they know they will benefit themselves. They're not doing it for money. They're doing it because the next time they're stuck in a traffic jam, they can rely on other people to help them get out of it. So crowdsourcing from this whole sort of social sharing thing that is part of digital is an increasing way, an increasingly profitable way of producing better results. And then in the science side, if you like, and the pure commercial side, if you analyze enough data, you can start to get down to a level of granularity and a level of forecasting, even when it comes to doing things like weather forecasting. And the Climate Corporation simply does this better than anyone else. Working with Monsanto, they can actually offer better rates for crop failure insurance than anyone else. Because they don't forecast the weather for an entire region, they'll forecast the weather for the microclimate in your particular farm. And if you're a small farmer for whom that crop represents the difference between prosperity and poverty over the winter, that's important. And everyone always dismisses agriculture as being saying it's just a bunch of farmers messing around with tractors and so on. Farming is a high-tech industry. There are lots and lots of examples of algorithmic business today. You come across it all the time. When you put in an insurance claim, it is almost certain that it will be analyzed by an algorithm, by a bot. When you put in your tax return, it will be analyzed by an algorithm. And it will come along and say, you know, for people with your amount of income, the amount of interest you've declared is on the low end. And maybe you want to rethink about restating your interest because otherwise the threat is there, we're going to investigate you. Algorithms are doing that. My son phoned me up a few years ago when he was looking for a job coming out of university and said, I put an application in and I was rejected in 10 minutes. Well, I had to explain to him that actually no one looked at it. That was an algorithm. It looked at your application and whatever keyword they were looking for, you didn't have in it. A lot of that stuff is being done automatically. Robotic wealth advisors. You know, if you're not truly wealthy and you're looking for financial investment advice, the probability is you're going to end up talking to a robot. A robot is a software program. And it will give you a certain advice based upon the data you give it. We're seeing that, and that's displacing, in some cases, jobs. You know, there's good ways and bad ways of doing this. There's one of the banks in Scotland recently announced that they were actually laying off 160 wealth advisors to replace them with robot wealth advisors. Not the best of PR by any means. Far better to say we're extending the capabilities to offer these services that were previously reserved only for our wealthy clients to everybody. That goes down a lot better with the public. On a more serious note, perhaps, although there's nothing non-serious about money, a lot of medical diagnosis and analysis now is being done by a computer. IBM's Watson is getting particularly heavily involved in this. Looking at all the tests, suggesting new tests, analyzing all the results, reading all the relevant literature, the thousands of papers, and advising the doctor on what the likely prognosis is. Which course of treatment? What is the likelihood of success? How likely is this patient to survive? What are the side effects? Now, the important thing to note here is that all of this is just advice. You know, the computer, the software, the algorithm is not making the decision that is down to the doctor, although it has to be said that it's either a very smart doctor or a very dumb doctor who in the age of legal responsibility and liability and professional indemnity insurance is going to throw away all this data and say, no, I don't believe that, I'm going to do this. So it's certainly influencing the outcome a lot. But IBM doesn't want to get sued. 
So it's just advising the doctor and allows the doctor to actually do what hopefully they're better at, that empathizing in breaking the news, good or bad, to the poor patient. Things like scheduling servicing, whether it's servicing of an industrial piece of machinery on an oil rig, analyzing the reports and the data coming from it, the wear and tear, the, the speed, the temperature of oil, the noise levels, vibration, and so on, and deciding to actually service this before it breaks down. Happening a lot on aircraft, it's increasingly happening in cars. You, know, you don't service things on a monthly basis, now you service them when they actually need to. So if you drive it really hard, then it'll be serviced more frequently. And in fact, if you want to actually get to talk to a Gartner analyst, you end up talking to an algorithm. Explain what you want to cover, and it will work out who the best analyst is and when they're available and so on. So a lot of person scheduling can be done as well. Sometimes it works better than others, I have to admit. Ecosystems are increasingly important because it's about sharing data. You know, Goldman Sachs used to have trading algorithms, the algorithms that decided which shares, which they bought, which they sold, when, and so on. They could move markets, but were regarded as the secret source. This was what made them competitive. They've now given them away. It's taking a leaf from the computer gaming world. Freemium, it's called. Give someone something for free, and then use the concept of in-app purchases or subsequent purchases. Goldman Sachs are looking for the commissions that come when you actually make trades to make money. It's also a defensive mechanism, because if you give something someone for free, why would they go out and buy something equivalent from someone else? You know, build them, suck them into your ecosystem, and help them actually stay there. Make it sticky. It's about making things sticky now and giving people value and then extracting the money from them later. How do you do this? A digital technology or digital business technology platform. And organizations have a real messy set of infrastructure. We all have lots and lots of applications inside organizations that sometimes work together and sometimes don't. Legacy is a terrible thing. Legacy is holding organizations back. And every organization has legacy. Everything you build is legacy from the moment that you actually think about it. So how do you minimize it? Well, we divide things into five platforms. Basically, there is your traditional IT, the systems of record, your ERP systems and so on. That's your information side of things. That's the internal IT. You have your customer-facing ones, your CRM, your websites, your social media. That interfaces, and in the middle, you have information. Increasingly now, the two new ones are this Internet of Things ecosystem. How do you manage those devices? How do you manage those 25 billion or more devices that are pumping information in? Or if you are an automotive manufacturer or whatever, how do you manage your products? Because a car is not a mechanical device anymore. It is simply a collection of computers. It happens to have wheels, but it's producing data. So you're moving from a product. You don't sell a car. You sell a service, mobility. And there is a constant relationship of how do you actually suck the data out of there, how do you deal with it appropriately, and so on, raising all sorts of questions about dealership channels and things like that. And then on top of that, your ecosystems. It used to be that organizations built everything themselves. But that's very old-fashioned, it's very time-consuming, and we simply don't have time to do that. So knowing when to share, knowing which ecosystems to be part of, whether you need to build your own ecosystem and bring people in to support you, or whether you need to contribute to others becomes a very important thing. Ecosystems allow small organizations to compete very effectively with large organizations. And small organizations tend to be more nimble. It allows them to compete on much more even footing. So that's bytes. We've talked a little bit about bots. We'll talk more. But let's talk about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s. And the stated aim at that time was to actually replicate the human brain. And it is fair to say artificial intelligence has failed. We are no closer to replicating the human brain now than we were in the 1950s. Now, speaking as a biologist by training, which I am, that doesn't surprise me. The neuroscientists today don't know what intelligence is. We don't know how the human brain works. So how these technologists believe they can replicate something that we don't know how it works is kind of interesting. But that doesn't really matter. That kind of misses the point. The point is that artificial intelligence is capable of doing things now that we never believed possible. 
Five years ago, when DARPA first launched their autonomous vehicles challenge, or it might have been six or seven now, there were 17 or so contestants, and they were trying to actually navigate a vehicle across a desert. Not one of them got more than about 15 kilometers. Nowadays, we are on the cusp of seeing autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, driving around the roads here in Barcelona, or in the United States, in the United Kingdom, everywhere. The automotive industry reckons that by the mid-2020s, by 2025 or so, a significant proportion of vehicles on the road will be driving themselves. That is unimaginable compared to where we were just a few years ago. We believed that this was something computers would not be able to do. In the same way that we believed Go, the Chinese game, was far too complicated for computers to ever master, and humans would always be better. Well, computers won at chess, which was simple in comparison, and now computers won not just by a little bit, but by a lot, 4-1, in a competition with the, best, the world's best human player, who admitted at the end that playing a machine was very, very different because it didn't have the usual human reactions on which they relied so much. And that's one of the interesting things, because artificial intelligence creates a device that can act like a human, but it doesn't have human emotions. You know, these are not alive. These are computers. The advances in artificial intelligence have come through machine learning, deep neural networks, and a whole raft of different technologies, which sufficiently complex to make my brain hurt whenever I try thinking about it. But believe me, they work. And what they give artificial intelligence is the ability to come up with new novel outcomes, things that we didn't immediately see. We don't train artificial intelligence systems. We don't program them in the normal way. In many cases, we lead them off and let them discover. You know, if you want an artificial intelligence engine to work out how to actually recognize objects, show it a billion images. Well, who's got a billion images? Well, the Googles and the YouTubes and the Facebooks and the Microsofts of this world. It is no mistake, there's no accident that the big companies with all of the data are becoming the leaders in artificial intelligence because they have the data to train these devices very well. The alternative is to use less data and more people time. Artificial intelligence engines with machine learning are starting to outperform humans in many areas. Recognizing objects, visual recognition, a whole range of things. Now, before you start getting carried away, that does not mean that it is automatic that artificial intelligence engines are going to replace people. Because there are social reasons why we still want to keep people employed. There are reasons, in many cases, that you know, labor costs may be low. Artificial intelligence engines are expensive. So it's more cost effective, more sensible to use people but the capabilities are there. So it is going to change. It gives people a brain, does artificial intelligence, or it gives devices a brain. It helps them to understand unstructured data, which humans are very bad at. But there is a gross difference between knowing and understanding. And therefore, my own belief and our position is quite clear that the future lies not with artificial intelligence, but with synthetic intelligence. This combination of an AI engine to do the groundwork and a human brain with unique capabilities that humans actually have to provide judgment and understanding and balance. Narrow AI, as it's called, where we have a constrained problem, is getting to be very good. General AI is the stuff of Hollywood. The idea of computers that we are going to fall in love with. Robots that will just roam around doing whatever they do, acting like people, and so on. That's not likely to happen in the next decade or even two decades, possibly three decades, but it could happen tomorrow. This is an uncertain area, but it is not something to worry about. It's great in Hollywood, but you know, we're not going to wake up one day any, near, any time in the near future and realize that the computers have realized we're all a danger to them and they're going to get rid of us. Terminator is good movies, but it's not real life. Do expect to see regulation and licensing. But equally, understand that AI is changing the relationship between us and technology. A few years ago, technology was a tool that we used. And then as we got things like Siri and Cortana and so on, it became an aid. It became a subordinate. We could ask it questions, and it could do simple stuff. As that technology grows, it will do more and more complicated things. It comes from being a subordinate to a peer, to a workplace partner. And ultimately, when we jump into a self-driving car that has no steering wheel, 
we become the subordinate. The machine, the computer, the AI engine is deciding where we're going, how we're getting there, how it's going to drive, and so on. That's a philosophical and moral dilemma. That's dependent on our ability as humans to cope with the fact that we are no longer in control and our relationship with technology has changed. But that is what, the truth of what we're facing. Bots are the current explosion of AI. You know, this is not simple speech recognition. This is speech recognition that understands the context of what we want. It might be easy to say to Amazon's Echo, turn on the lights. But that requires a knowledge of which lights, where we are. Are they on or are, are they off? How do I connect to them? How do I control them? There's a whole range of things. When you talk to a help desk and say, whatever, what is the price of this? How does, it, does this work? Where is this in stock? You're talking almost certainly to a bot. The challenge for organizations is not do you use the bots, but at what point do you hand over from a bot to a real person? Because computers are good at some things. The smart thing is when does the computer system, when does the AI engine recognize that it no longer knows the answer and says, excuse me, let me pass you on to someone who can help. And then you're talking to a real person. Synthetic intelligence, not artificial intelligence. But these are ways that we will in the future transform what we do with data and enable our organizations to be much more successful and much more powerful. There's an ABC to this, artificial intelligence and algorithms. Bots, bots are simple chunks of code that do one thing and do it very well. Chatbots are a specific form of bot and they are likely to become the primary way we interface to devices. We will talk to them. We will actually tell devices what we want and they will understand and they will do our command and they will talk back to us. Now it's gonna be an interesting world and in the early stages it's no doubt going to be amusing because they will misunderstand us and so on, but things will improve. It does enable a complete transformation of the customer experience. Automated assistance 24 seven. And at the same time, AI enables bots to get physical. And alongside artificial intelligence, the big growth area of the next decade is robotics. Robotics and smart materials, and the two are kind of combined. Social robots, robots that are designed specifically to empathize with humans. Now, remember what I said, these are machines, they are not alive, they have no feelings, but we can give them the illusion of feelings. And we do this in a number of ways. One is about listening and knowing the sorts of things to say. The other is actually kind of clever from a technology point of view and is about how do we manipulate people's emotions. Now, social robots are almost, by, without exception, small. They're about four foot high, typically. And they tend to have big faces and big eyes. Why? Well, there's two reasons. Firstly, it's very difficult to be frightened of a four foot high robot. You know, when I was growing up in the 1960s, robots in science fiction were these huge, big mon metal monsters and they had laser beams and they were gonna kill you. You don't want one of those in a hospital. So a four foot one is kind of cute. The other thing is big eyes, big face. It's about babies. You know, you might think, many of you, I'm sure, I don't like children. Well, believe me, in your genes, you are programmed to be nurturing and caring towards small things with big eyes relative to their face. It's babies. So, you know, we are being manipulated by the robot designers to feel warm and friendly and loving and caring towards these devices, even though it's a machine. Collaborative robots. Collaborative robots are specifically designed to work in close proximity to humans. And believe me, this is a big thing. If you go into a robotic production line and manufacturing facility or a robotic warehouse and you've got a robot moving a pallet load weighing a couple of tons at 30 miles an hour down an alleyway, you do not want to stand in front of it. Because two tons of whatever and robot on you only comes to one outcome and it's not good. Collaborative, that's why in those sort of environments the people are kept one side of the barrier and the robots are kept the other. Collaborative robots on the other hand are stuffed full of sensors such that if you hold up your finger and the robot touches it, it will stop instantly. Now I've done this at one of the suppliers and believe me, it takes a certain amount of nerve for this robot holding an engine block weighing sort of half a ton to come swinging around at you and think, yes, he said, if I hold up my finger, I'll be safe. But you get ready to duck and yes, it works. 
But that allows robots to actually become much more powerful and useful assistants. So collaborative robots is a very special area. Drones, we've seen a lot of drones causing more problems than they're providing solutions to at the moment, and self-driving vehicles, probably trucks to start with, but ultimately taxis and cars and so on. Now, and again, all of this is about the technology becoming more powerful, more integral to our lives. And all of those sort of things change the business model. You know, if you have a self-driving car, I was having an interesting discussion. You know, I was talking to a company in South Africa whose main business is recovering stolen cars, big business in South Africa. And we were sort of musing, well, what happens if someone steals a self-driving car? Well, the answer is you can't. You can borrow it, but it just drives home again. <laughs> End of their business. So they're worried about what do they do next. You know, and the reality is, if you've got a car that drives itself, why would you buy it in the first place? You know, you want it to get to work, and it knows it needs gas. So why am I going to waste time sitting in my car while it goes to the gas station to fill itself up? I might as well send it off, go fill up with gas, and by the way, just run as an Uber taxi for the rest of the day, be back here at 4.30, and we'll see how much money you've made. <laughs> it's a different concept, and the same happens. And this is when we go from business through to transformation. We're no longer selling the same stuff. We're working in a very, very different sort of environment. Because we're reaching a point in the next few years when things become customers. And everything we do in business today is pretty much predicated on this idea that you're going to be selling to a person, or you're selling to a person who's working on behalf of an organization. You can't have an emotional relationship with a bot. So all of your CRM systems go straight out the window, because it's no longer about trying to encourage them. In fact, the relationship moves, as I said, with the shopping sites, from you determining what you want to them determining what it offers you. So your bot is going to be working on your behalf and negotiating with their bot to come up with the best price, the fastest delivery, whatever. Things as customers is a huge, huge societal change. It creates all sorts of problems. I mean, firstly, it breaks all of the payment systems today because we'd be talking about trillions of transactions, microtransactions, which the likes of Visa and the banking environment will struggle with. So you know, you've got all sorts of repercussions here. But my bots are going to be working with your bots to come up with a mutually beneficial environment. And that's going to be an interesting sort of future. Liability and regulation comes in there. You, know, you can't sue a bot. A bot is not a person. So I have to trust my bot to make decisions. I'm going to give it access to my wallet. But I'm going to give it strict guidelines and a budget. And believe me, if it exceeds the budget and spends too much, I'll disconnect it. You know, it's as simple as that. We'll have a different relationship with these bots. And those things will collaborate, and they'll, co they'll work together. They'll get to be sneaky, I'm sure. There'll be collectives of bots working there to come up with, you know, bots form their own Groupon type of environment to get better deals. It's going to be an interesting future when things are bots, when things are customers. We're still there, but there's more things out there than people. So the next generation of business model is going to be very different. And we're used to these conventional ones of B2B and B2C and so on. But in the world of tomorrow, with AI embedded into the cloud and data about everything we do embedded into the cloud, who is the customer and who is the manufacturer becomes an interesting point. With 3D printing, if I have a 3D printer, am I the manufacturer? Or I, do I just download the design? Who supplies it? How does the logistics work? It gets to be very messy, particularly when you introduce bots and chatbots in there. You know, all this conventional segmentation of businesses, consumers, manufacturers, suppliers, and so on, starts to break down. That says one thing. That's opportunity with a capital O. Lots and lots of opportunities for organizations to intermediate into the value chain and to actually start doing things and gaining access to many of those transactions and the revenue that comes from it. So recommendations, every organization needs to look at the data, the sources of data, the types of data, and start to work out where you can discover new opportunities, new revenue. Analytics, AI are going to grow. They're going to disrupt industries. Some industries will disappear. Others will tra be transformed. There's no doubt about it. And working out which of those is going to be critical. AI is not the silver bullet. It is powerful. It's a great technology, but it is not the answer to everything. You can't afford to wait on the sidelines, though.
you need to be experimenting now. And it's easy to do. There's a lot of AI toolkits out there that are publicly available. You can start working with this stuff today, even though it may be some time before you actually start to use it in a real life situation. Define your strategies for AI, for ecosystems, for platforms, and so on. And think about this connected systems, connected devices as customers. It is going to impact your business model, and it is going to change the way you do business and how you do business and who you're doing business with. And that is going to be truly transformational. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Um, thank you particularly for speaking to, listening to me in English. Um, but believe me, it would have been a very short presentation in Spanish. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>